Allow your child to be educated to compete with his. And people just put their head down. They didn't say nothing. They didn't nothing had to be said. What we're talking about now is bring our family together. And we realize that as God we pointed out many, many years ago, when all other means fail to organize the people, conditions will. And I'm telling you, those conditions are right. The Pan-African movement is on target. It's the, in the right direction. Amen. And God, we also said, when all other means fail to organize the people, conditions will. But more than that, men who are earnest, men and women who are earnest, are not afraid of consequences. When we talk about Africa for the Africans, I, I give you the slogan that was put together from what Carlos Cooks heard. He said, Mr. White Man, Mr. European, do you think that you can withstand the power of Africa and Asia combined? Do you think that you can continue to rule the world on both? Do you think that Africans will stand for that all the time? I say to you, Europe for the Europeans, Asia for the Asians, but above all, Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. Thank you very much. Give our beloved elder, Baba, the London Brad, some more love. And you know what? Please give his wife, his partner, some love. Not here, she's not here. She's not here. But this. Yes, thank you in spirit, thank you so much. But this woman, each time I call, this great African woman, she would be so kind for me to mess with her great African man. That's right, give her some love, please, that's right. At this time, brothers and sisters, we're gonna take a quick break, and then we're gonna hear from him Hotep. Agbar Imhotep, we're going to hear from Dr. Leonard Jeffries to go right to the agenda now. We're going to hear from Professor James Small straight to the agenda and Dr. Sheldon Lewis straight to the agenda for action. Please take a quick break, support the African business. Bye black and come back. That's right. Well, because I'm a storyteller, how you doing, brother? And I come to events like this, I'm often asked to speak. and. Uh, I, I, and, and even though I do storytelling for a living, what my work is I'm working for the people. So a brother said I'm a leader, I'm, I'm really basically just a servant. And see, because when I come to events like this, I, be, I come ready to sign up, you know? Like give me, the, give me the application form, tell me when the follow-up meeting is. Even better than that, give me my task. Give me my assignment. And we don't wait till, we won't wait till the next Pan-African Summit. So that's, that's how you plug me in. But since I'm a storyteller, I want to call the part. That's what I'll do. I'll share a little parable with you that I attempted the right way. Because the parable is still kind of evolving. I often say to people that it takes a parable about a thousand years really to get to where you can just tell it. So this is a story that we wrote about five or six years ago and we told it a few times. And I kind of edited it talking to Brother Hakeem and Sister Fu a few minutes ago. And I think what I got now may take me another few months, okay? Uh, so, uh, I titled the story Baba Shekham Abdullah. And there was a reason why I called it Baba Shekham Abdullah because I've actually met Babas, I've met Shekhams, and I've met a lot of Abdullahs. So we call this story Baba Shekham Abdullah. And Baba Shekham Abdullah was a real famous uh, unifier and united, so I should say he's a pan Africanist, world famous, internationally known. And he had written theorems and, and theories and whatnot to help African people get together with whatever their religious different, wherever, wherever they came from with regard to religion or spirituality, wherever they came from politically, if they applied Baba Sheikh and Abdullah's theories and ideas, they would be able to work together in peace and harmony. 
And it just so happened that Bobby Shaker had come to Atlanta on the speaking engagement. And he was dropping off the rental car there at the car rental place out by the airport. And he ran and runs into this young poet storyteller guy by the name of Jesse Abdul. Now Jesse Abdul has never had a chance to meet and uh, shake hands with the great Baba, but he, he had heard him speak. He would read his book, he would listen to his CD, he would even watch some old DVD. But here he was, in the car running place, with an opportunity to go one on one. And just that dude went over to the great Bobby and he said, Bobby Shaker, excuse me, I know who you are, I'm not going to waste your time. I just have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Bobby says, well, we're here, we may as well talk. Bobby said, oh, Bobby, I know who you are, I'm just that dude. But here's the first question I want to ask. He said, Bobby, what can I do to change my life? Bobby Shakem looked at Jesse Abdul, he said, Jesse, uh, here in America you have a saying that the grass is never greener on the other side. He said, yeah, yeah, I know that, I know that ever since I was a boy, I know, I know that, the grass is never greener on the other side. And Bobby says, that's not true. Sometimes the grass is greener on the other side, but you must always remember it is only grass. It's only grass. Oh, let me think about that one, Bobby, but let me ask you another question. He says, Bobby, can you tell me what I can do to change the world? Because everywhere I go, I don't care, north, south, east, or west, they all want to know what they can do to change the world. And Jesse Abdul, I'll tell you like I tell all the rest. If you want to change the world, you must first clean your own basement. Say so what? You must first clean your own basement, and it may have nothing to do with the house. Oh, Bob, hope. Okay, I gotta start with me. Okay, Bob, I got that. Now, Bob, can you tell me how I can really serve the people? Well, Jesse Abdul, that is a good one. Because if you want to serve the people, you must first know the people. You must love the people. And you must always speak truth to the people. Because he who speaks the truth does not have to remember his answers. Jesse said, Bob, oh. Here's the shuttle bus. I know you're going to the airport, but thank you, Bob. You may go. Bob left, left Jesse and went over to the airport and went on to his next speech, speaking engagement. Jesse Abdul wrote down the things that the Bob had told him, came back home, and was more committed to ever to serving the people. Thank you. Great African. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Where's Sister Imani? Front and center, African woman. Come on, African woman. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. How are you doing today? My name is Imani Jabali. I am a member of the Shrines of the Black Madonna. I am also a supporter of Charles Barron. He's an old, old friend of mine. And uh, I want to make a quick announcement. For those of you that would like to support his candidacy for Congress, uh, we've got just a few more envelopes. So if you'd like to make a donation, we're going to be on our way out for him to catch his flight in just a, a little while. But I could stick around for you to fill out the envelope and uh, put in your donations if you're able to do that. Uh, if you cannot, or you're willing to support his candidacy some other way, we have these uh, flyers that my daughter, who is uh, sitting over there, she's supposed to be up here supporting me. Uh, come on up here, daughter. <laughs> so if you're interested in getting one of these, she will come by and give you one so you could fill these out and give it right back to me. We'll be able to send you all some information, so please raise your hand if you like either one of these or if you like to fill out this envelope with your donation. And thank you so very much. Thank you. African woman. African woman. I would like everyone to please recognize my Baba. Please stand up, Baba and go to Foriata. Please stand up, Baba and go to Foriata. The director of the religious heritage of the African world at ITC. Powerful, strong African priest. That's right. Baba in Dugu to Foriata. That's right, Baba. Love you, Baba. That's right. Also, Dr. Asa Hilliard is in the house. Dr. Asa Hilliard, give him some love. That's right. 
That's right. Excellent. At this time, dear brothers and sisters, and quickly, we're going to move forward with the agenda in terms of moving forward real fast in terms of getting to the Pan-African objective. I would like at this time for Mama, Dr. Shelby Lewis to come before us and to share in terms of Pan-Africanism and economics. Please give Mama Shelby Lewis some love. Thank you, Brother Beverly. I think we should all give him a hand. He's been just fantastic putting this all together. Hotep, my brothers and sisters. I think all of you probably remember or know something about Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer said, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. And the people in the economic workshop said, we are sick and tired of talking about what needs to be done. We want action. That was the message from that group. I, I will tell you this uh, by way of making myself feel very good, but at a conference that's to be here in Atlanta, the National Conference of Black Political Scientists, uh, 23rd through the 26th of uh, March, I am the recipient of the Fannie Lou Hamer Award. Now, when we start talking about economic development, the people in the workshop, and they were fantastic people, I have your names, I'm gonna call you, we are going to meet again, our work is not complete. You don't build an institution in three days. So we're going to continue to work on it. But the vision was, we want to build an organization that facilitates the institutionalization and the implementation of our vision of Pan-Africanism. And what that vision is, is a Pan-African world where we trust and love each other. This means we need a Pan-African world where we have earned the trust of each other. Well. That we are accountable, we are efficient, and we give back. Part of that vision is a world where our children can see a future for themselves. A future without the degradation that they face every day a future with the knowledge, with the skills to chart their own course, their own future. That means we've got to control the education. Because this Pan-African world is one where we know who we are. We have liberated minds. And we need liberated minds to have liberated people. There is an old saying that there are some people who have so internalized their oppression that if there were not a back door, they would make one. Huh. Well. We want our children to have a future where it never occurs to them that there is a back door. We are talking about a future where children can communicate and see themselves in the media and the images are not negative. The images are not of criminals and drug addicts. I don't know whether you notice the programs on TV, but even when they are just created, if there is an arrest or someone has done something and he's black, they just bust the door down and pull out. Same program a week later, white person has done the same thing, they observing all of the protocols. That image is not lost on our children. Wow. And it is not lost on other Africans in the Pan-African world. 
I want to tell you two stories. I was at this conference in Washington, and there was this lady who had taken a group of young high school kids from Washington, D.C. to Gory Island, this symbol that we go to to show we have come from Africa and people look back and they cry, they weep when they go to Africa. Well, there were a lot of young people from other parts of the world there. And one young man from South Africa came up to the young black people and said to the young men who were there, why don't you all do something and stop taking all of those drugs? Why don't you make something of yourselves? And here are these high school kids who thought they were doing something who had themselves deflated. And the reason they were deflated is because the images of young black males in the media mm -hmm. are drug addicts. That's what they see when they turn on the television in Nigeria. That's what they see when they turn on the television in uh, South Africa. And even though the American export of hip hop and rap is probably the biggest export in the world, is still negative. And so we want kids who don't see that image of themselves, and we want a world where other African people do not see themselves and us that way. Another story I want to tell you is, I guess maybe two years ago, a friend of mine who had been an ambassador in Uganda when I was there, was from Nigeria, had come to visit Atlanta. And uh, he called me, and we were talking. And he said, Shelby, now, I've been to America once before, but this is the first time I've spent some time here. And I'm really upset. Why is it that every time I turn on the TV, the people who are arrested for crime or black. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let me just say one thing to you. When a person is arrested and they don't show the picture, they're white. Yep. Yep. So that tells you something about the standard that we're dealing with in America. But people who come here for the first time don't understand that. Mm -hmm. And all too frequently, Africans and Afro-Latinos and people from other parts of the world come here and they see those images and they develop the same attitudes about African Americans that white America has because of the media. Yeah. So we're talking about a pan-African world where we control our communications, where our children see images of themselves, their fathers, their mothers, their sisters, their brothers that are positive images, images that they can look up to. And we want to see it every day, not just on February, the shortest month of the year. We need a pan-African world in terms of our vision where African people count. They are the first to be served. Now, what kinds of institutions? are we talking about building? The people in the economic workshop said, we need financial institutions that we control. He who pays the piper calls the tune. So if we got to go to the Ford Foundation or the government or whoever there is for money, then we gotta do what they want us to do. And the question they ask is, where is the money in the black community? And we know there is plenty of money in the black community. The point was, we've got to do an organization where we use our resources, and our resources we control, and we determine what we do, when we do it, where we do it, and how we do it. They also maintain that we have to have institutions that 
are security conscious. Now I know as well as you do that a lot of young blacks, especially young males, if they're in trouble, the last person or the last group they'll call the police. Their taxpayers' money is there for that protection. But there was this young man here day before yesterday who had written the book about police exploitation of blacks, both white and black policemen. So we need a world where our own security is dealt with. I suppose we need a Pan-African fruit of Islam. Okay. Even Michael Jackson knew that was important. <laughs> One of the other points that the group made is that we need to control real estate. We need to control the land where we grow our food. We need to control our homes, you know, or we need to build our own. You know, look, I'm in Atlanta. I was away for a while and I came back and places that were woods and dilapidated areas have got these signs up. 500 to 600,000, 800,000, 300,000 homes. And these are selling. Some of them are sold out before they finish. But who's building these homes? They are not African Americans for the most part. So what this economic group was saying is that we need to build our own. And we need to have the land, own the land. We know that here and everywhere, they've taken land. They continue to take land. They steal homes. They, there is one thing you have to say about the other group. They are very good thieves. They, have, they, they will steal the land. So we have to be very careful. Our security is there. The, well, two other things they were saying is we need to control not just the politics, but the distribution of resources in our society. The countries of the world that are majority African gained independence starting in uh, the 1950s with Ghana, 57, and they controlled the political power to a certain extent. But the commanding heights of economic power have still eluded them. We call it neo-colonialism. Mm -hmm. But you know, brothers and sisters, I've been going back and forth for 45 years. And in the last 10 or 12 years, I have noticed that it has moved from colonialism to outright, I mean, sorry, it has moved from neo-colonialism to outright advocacy of recolonizing Africa. And some people are saying it without shame. The first time I ran across it, I was in Togo about 10, 15 years ago. And uh, the, the US Cultural Center, this was before USIA was all part of the State Department. And this young lady, white woman, said, you know, you're here, it's February, would you talk? And uh, would you talk about reparations? And I talked about reparations. And her question, she was trying to channel. She says, well, you know, Africans are saying that they need reparations too. You all are the ones who were enslaved. Why would they need reparations? And I said, why not? Uh, they were left without the young and the strong in their communities. OK, that's one thing they need reparations for, because their labor their laborers were taken away. And so why shouldn't they get reparations? Apart from that, look at, uh, what, what is it when you, you have an accident? Uh, it's not just, it's the pain and suffering. That's what I'm looking for. Look at the pain and suffering from having your kin taken away. This does not mean that there weren't Africans involved. Okay, we know they were, but for the most part, 
the taking away with lies and the brutality and the cruelty that accompanied it, they couldn't have imagined that. So there was pain and suffering. They need reparations too. So she and some of the other people there were talking. This is after the session. So Frenchman, Britisher, and this American. And they're saying, you're right. Because their, their position was, the problem with Africa is not that it was exploited. It was that it wasn't exploited enough. And look at what is happening now. The only way to get this right is for us to come back in and take over. That, that was their view. That's recolonization. Now there are two other things that happened. About five years ago, I was at uh, the United States Agency for International Development, and there was this person reporting on the meeting of the G8, you know, the big Western powers. And they were so pleased with themselves. They said, we have had this meeting, and for the first time, we are together on democratization of Africa. We can make these decisions. We can move into various countries and we can democratize. And I was an intern and we were told uh, that we weren't supposed to, you know, to speak. We were just interns. But I raised my hand and I said, you know, it strikes me that this notion of democratization is decidedly un